larger consciousness system is a digital information system. And that all experiences are subjective. Okay, consciousness is the fundamental reality. Okay, that's our schedule, at least the bottom part of it is our Sunday schedule. You can see it's a lot smaller than our Saturday schedule. Um, okay, we're going to be talking about experiencing the larger reality. How can you experience it, and when you do experience it, what do you find, and uh, how do you interpret it? First question I get asked is, can everybody do it? Can I do these things? I think a lot of you found out uh, yesterday, late yesterday when we finished with the uh, exercises, that you could do things that you didn't know that you could do. I've had several people come up to me yet this morning and say, I got all of those right. You know, so, uh, and that was amazing because there was no meditation, there was no uh, preparation. It was just, you know, focus your mind and do it. And that was kind of amazing that uh, it actually works, and it does. The more you practice it, the better it works. So can anybody do it? Yes, of course, your consciousness. Because your consciousness, you can do these sorts of things. But then, of course, anybody can learn to play the piano or play a violin too, right? If you have arms and ears and hands and things, you can, you can do that. But most of us don't because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of practice and uh, we just don't do it. And this is the same way. Most people don't, even though everybody can. It's not, uh, it's not common that people take the time. So you have to, if you're going to get good at healing or remote viewing or looking at auras or collecting any of this information, diagnosing, if you're going to get good at it, then it takes time and practice to do that. Um, should becoming operational in the non-physical reality be a main goal? We, I think we already talked about that and basically, no. I don't think that ought to be your primary motivation or reason for going into this spiritual discovery path. I think you ought to primarily want to grow up you want it to primarily reduce your entropy, increase your quality of consciousness. That should be your primary focus. And then learning how to see ours and heal people and, and uh, go into the maybe future probable database and see the probabilities of what's happening. Those things should all be secondary. It's kind of collateral stuff that'll, that'll happen that you'll learn how to do it if you want to, if you practice at it. But like anything else, it takes practice. You experience it, you may be get some of it, some of it you don't, you do it again, kind of see how is it that you feel when it works and how do you feel and how is your mind when it didn't work and you do it again. You just have to keep working at it. It's not something you'll be good at the first time you try, but it's not all that hard either. So six months, a year, you work at it conscientiously, you should start to see results. It's not like you have to work on it for 20 years before something will happen. It's not that hard, but it does take uh, con constant effort. Okay, how do you go about doing it? I always uh, tell people to start with meditation. And why do you start with meditation? Meditation is a tool. It's not an end result. For some, some people get into meditation and meditation becomes an end in itself, just to meditate. And that's okay, but that's limiting. Meditation is just a tool. And what meditation is, is it gets you familiar with your own consciousness. I mean, here you are, consciousness. We're all consciousness. We're all netted. Good place to start is say hello to your own consciousness. And that's what you do when you meditate. You let go of the noise. You let go of all the chatter. And the point of your meditation should be to become this, this uh, point consciousness. So what is point consciousness? Point consciousness is where you exist only as a point of consciousness. Okay, you're in a, it's basically being in, a, in the void 
in a dark space and you exist and that's all there is. There's no, nothing else. So all of the sensory data you get, your, you know, what you hear, what you smell, what you see, all of that's gone. You just exist as a point of consciousness floating in the void. That's a very lovely place to be. And in some disciplines of meditation, that's the end point. That's nirvana. That's, the, that's where you get after 25 or 30 years of practice. It doesn't have to be that way. You can get there after just you know, a few months of practice if you work at it. So you get to that place of point consciousness where you, you exist. That's the doorway. Rather than an end point, that's the start point. Once you learn to go there, everything else then is easy. Because what that point is, it's where you've let go of all the chatter. You've let go of all the input. You are just consciousness. That means you're focused. Your intent now is focused. And you don't use your intellect to direct you. You use your, your cognitive ability at the being level. There's a difference in your cognitive ability at the intellectual level. That's where you judge, that's where you compare, that's where you do analysis, and your, and your mental ability or directive ability at the being level. That's just where you are. That's just the I am. And what I want to do is heal this person, or what I want to do is diagnose, or what I want to do is go out of body and travel to these places, or explore the larger reality. And from there, your intent will open all of those doors. So the first place to learn to get to is point consciousness. And it's just a matter of learning to, to let go. Now one thing that people get uh, hung up about right away is, is this real or am I making it up? Is this my imagination? Or is this something from outside of me? Well, that's really a good question because there are two sources of data. One source of data is what you create. It's an inside source, as we will. It's inside your own consciousness. You are consciousness. You're creative. You can make up data. And then there's another source of data that's outside of you. We'll call that outside data. That's data that does not come from you. You're not the origin. It's someplace else, and you just get it. Okay, and interpret it. So how can you tell the difference between the inside data and the outside data? You can't. Without experience. It's not like one of them, you know, is blue and the other one's green. You just have to have experience. That experience will let you know, and it's kind of hard to say exactly how you know that. Part of it is that the data that comes from outside of you is foreign to you. It's not your attitude. It's not your information. It's things you had no idea about. So the first sense is a feeling of it being foreign or outside of you, doesn't belong to you. It's not something you would have thought. That's a good clue. The other way you tell is just with experimentation. You do it enough times that you get sensitive to the different quality of the data between inside data and outside data. And the way you do it is the various tools that we just talked about. You can remote view, you can heal. So you're getting outside data. The data you're getting when you heal is data from the database. Okay, we're looking at the problem, we're looking at the, the current, the history database. Remember that history database, when you say history, you think something that's old. Well, the history database at its most current point starts at 10 to the minus 44 seconds after the present moment. So it's pretty up to date. When you get that historical database, you're really looking at the present, very close to the present, okay, just a tad later than the present. When you get that information, it has a quality that's different to it that I cannot describe to you in logical terms because it's not a logical process. It's an intuitive process. It has a different quality to it. So you will have to find that quality difference yourself through your practice. So practice your healing. Practice your remote viewing. Uh, practice uh, getting data from the databases. Keep track of when you're right. So it has to be stuff that you can check on. So don't don't uh, spend a lot of time doing things that aren't evidential in the beginning. Afterwards, you can let that go. So in the beginning, you want to do those things that, that you can check later, like we did with this, these diagnosing exercises we did. You could check. I told you what was wrong, and you either got, you know, 
got it right or you didn't. And you'll find you'll get better at it and better at it. And you will eventually, after you've done this for some time, and again, six months, a year, a couple of years. I mean, some people will get it in three weeks. Some people may take a couple of years. But work at it until you know the difference between outside data and inside data. Then it becomes just as clear as light and dark. It's not confusing anymore. But it is an intuitive thing that you have to develop with experience. It's not an intellectual thing. Um, so what is your imagination? Your imagination is inside data. It's the data you create. Okay. Many people, when they uh, go to the Monroe Institute, this is, a, this is the place where I hear this most, they do something that's called click out. What click out means is that they're following along in this exercise, and at one point, where well, you're listening to perhaps Bob's voice or somebody else voicing this tape, and you're told to go do something or interact with someplace or get some data, and they're gone. They lose consciousness, okay? They just lose consciousness at that point, and then as soon as that exercise is over, the consciousness comes back. And some people have a terrible time with that. They just click out. And some of you who meditate will have the same thing. You'll be meditating, and you'll have your mind, and it'll be clear, and suddenly you'll kind of become aware, and, and you know, 20 minutes went by, and now your time's up. You just kind of click out on it. What that is, often, there's several reasons for it, but one of the primary reasons is that you you can't differentiate between what you imagine and what's you know, the inside and outside information. Very left brain people, people who must have logical process. This doesn't happen much to right brain people. They hardly ever click out. It's the left brain people who click out because they can't tell whether it's real or not. So they get into this problem. They're asked to go get some information or see a particular picture or go to a particular place in an out-of-body situation, and they can't tell. Is that real or am I making it up? And that anxiety becomes so acute that they click out because they can't deal with the not knowing. Okay. That's impatience. They want to know right away. They need to know whether this is real. If it's not real, I'm wasting my time. If it is real, how do I know that? Well, because they can't get past that point, that's as far as they get. They're stopped there. That becomes a limitation. And some of you will have experienced that kind of a limitation, just not knowing. The way you get by that is to have a different attitude. It's to say, I'll find out later whether or not it's real. That's not really an important question right now. Right now, I just need to get experience. I just need to interact. So you do that. You just interact anyway without making this upfront decision, you know, that we all feel compelled to make. Should I believe it or should I not believe it? See, it's this old thing about belief, needing to believe it or not believe it. You should just be open-minded but skeptical. Go forward. Experience it. Have the experience. Do it. See how it works out. Check your data. And after you've done this for some months, you'll know whether it's inside data or outside. You'll know whether you're actually doing something. So the first biggest mistake in trying to experience the larger reality is that you get critical, you get judgmental too early before you have enough data to actually be judgmental. Now, some, sometime you do have to be critical. You know, you don't want to have open-mindedness without the skepticism. You may, you know, walk down some imaginary path but you don't want to get critical too soon. So if you're trying to experience a larger reality, just do it. You're talking to another entity. You hear kind of a, you get a message, and instead of saying, is that real? Am I talking to myself? You know, is this a real, instead of immediately getting into this, should I believe it or should I not, let that go. And just do it. Have the conversation. See where it goes. See what you learn. Ask that entity, can we talk again sometime, and how can I link up with you? And after you've spent hours and hours and hours in conversation, then you have enough data to decide, is this outside information, you see? So first, don't jump to the, should I believe it or should I not? That's the first big block 
for people experiencing this. Okay. Um, take the long view. You know, the, the, the process is experiment, 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 test, test, test. Gather evidence until you can tell what it is that you're doing. Um, okay. Let the left brain go. If you're going to be out in the larger reality, you kind of have to let the left brain go. All right. Approach to meditation. You see the highlighted words. The highlighted words point out that it's not about doing anything in particular. It's mostly about not doing. You are consciousness. Being able to attach to other data streams, other than this virtual reality data stream, is this, it's sort of your birthright as consciousness. You can do this. You're, it, it's innate to you to be able to do this. The problem is you have all sorts of beliefs and ideas and attitudes that get in the way. So learning to meditate isn't about learning a special new technique, a magic new mantra, or you know, the right uh, environment. It's about you know, fearing nothing, hoping for nothing, no expectations, no thinking, no analysis, no beliefs, don't compare, don't judge. It's all about not doing all the things we normally do, which means, in the shorter words, set the ego aside. That's the, that's the key. Uh, Collect evidential corroboration whenever you can. Set up experimental situations so that ev evidence will be generally available. And if this takes you five years, then work on it for five years. You see, if it takes 10, work on it for 10. Don't have a short-term goal that, okay, I'm gonna do this, and two weeks later, it hasn't happened yet. All right, I'm done, it doesn't work for me. You see, you can't learn to play the piano that way either. You know, it takes time. So have the long view. Feel that you're going to take as long as it takes. You'll just work at it. All right, some of the things that you can do. Um, you can do out of body. You notice I have a, a OBE, that's the out of body experience. But that's really a, a misnomer. And just that name creates blocks for a lot of people in experiencing the larger reality. Just the name itself. The OOME is an out-of-mind experience. That's more what you're doing, but being out of your mind has different connotations here. So we don't use that because it uh, isn't, isn't helpful. But out-of-body, the problem with it is it doesn't have anything to do with your body, you see? The out-of-body concept is that you have consciousness and somehow it's in your body. Right? It's like it's, your consciousness lives in your brain, or your consciousness is somehow inhabits your body, and you have to get it out of your body to go do something. That's not the way it is. Your consciousness is not in your body. You are consciousness. Your body is virtual. It's just a data stream. You don't have to get out of your body. You see, now we have people trying to do out of body, and they're lying there in bed, and Bob Monroe, when he wrote his book, said that he rolled out of body. So now you have thousands of people around the world lying there in bed, you know, trying to roll out a body, you know. Or they, somebody said, well, the, what I do is I hold up my, my non-physical hand, and then when I see that in my other, in my physical arm still down there, you know, and, I hold, and that's part of my process of getting out. People have all these little tools that they've used. And again, there's thousands of people, you know, with the hand coming up at night, and they're looking at it. Is that mine or is that the other? You know, it doesn't have anything to do with the body. And why is it that when people first get out of body, they look around and they can see their body laying there in bed, they look around their bedroom, they can see that. Why do they see that? Because they believe that if you get out of body, the first thing you're going to see is your room, where your body's lying down. That's just a belief, because you com are coming out of your body, you see. So all of these beliefs make it very difficult for you to actually experience the larger consciousness system because you're trapped in these expectations and in these beliefs. Whereas what's actually going on is your consciousness, you're using your tent to access data or to access another data stream in another reality frame. It's just a matter of intent, you see. That's why it worked for you, for a lot of you. It worked yesterday when we did these exercises even though we didn't get into a, you know, into a 
a meditative state. We didn't really get in an altered state. Just the fact of expressing your intent to do these things puts you in an altered state by itself. You don't have to go through a process and do it. You're just there. An altered state is when you let go of, all the, of operating on all the physical input here. What you see, you know, hear, smell, sounds, all that kind of thing, you let that go. Now yesterday you, didn't, you let it all go except my voice. So you, were, you still had a connection to the voice, but everything else you weren't hearing. You weren't, it's not that your ears didn't get the data of somebody coughing or paper shuffling. You got the data, you just didn't operate on it. It was a null operation, okay, and that's fine. So that's really what's going on. It's just your intent. Intent's the only active ingredient. Okay, um, you know, precognitive dreams, uh, lucid dreams, daydreams. People ask me, what's the difference between an out-of-body and a lucid dream? The only difference is the tools in which you use to get there and your beliefs and expectations while you're there. Okay. Other than that, there really is no difference. Okay, one of them, an out-of-body, you get there without ever losing consciousness. You start being conscious and then that consciousness is just transferred to a different data stream. In a lucid dream, you go unconscious first, you go to sleep, then you become aware in a dream that you're dreaming, and then you kind of take over that dream and get to do kind of what you want, you get in charge. Okay, you end up in around, you end up doing basically the same thing, which is letting go of this virtual reality, this physical reality data stream, and attaching to a different data stream. Mostly the same difference, but now most people who are doing lucid dreams limit themselves to kind of a dream world because that's what they believe. They're, they're loose in their dreams, so now they're just exploring this dream reality. They can do anything they want in that. They limit themselves with their beliefs. Okay, just like the out-of-body folks limit themselves to, you know, first finding themselves in their bedroom. Also, out-of-body people will, will feel like they have, you have to move to get someplace, right? This is another habit of this reality. If I'm going to get from A to B, I have to move. Well, that's not how you get from A to B in the larger conscious system. You just shift your intent and you teleport. You were at A, you're at B. So people who are, have beliefs that you have to move to go from one place to another, what do they do? They fly. So now they're out of body, you know, and spread out their wings and zoom and off they go and they have this sense of motion of flying. And that's how they get from A to B because they have a belief that says you have to travel. You have to see the scenery going by or you're not moving. You see, all of this is your belief systems limiting you. Okay, um, you can uh, visit other reality frames you can heal yourself and others. These other reality frames can be like this one. You know, other what we would call physical realities because they have real tight rule sets like here. They could be uh, like the dream reality. It could be uh, uh, very loosely uh, governed or, or have a very loose rule, rule set. And you can travel around in these various realities, but there's a little catch here. In order to get there, you have to know where it is. It's your intent. You have to say, I intend to go there, and you're there. But if you don't know that there exists, how can you say, I intend to go there? You see, so that's a problem. You have to explore. You start out knowing very little. You start out knowing very little. And uh, I liken this, and I'm jumping through my slides now mentally because it all, you know, it's just flowing a different way than it does sometimes, so we'll catch up later. But I give the analogy sometimes that it's like if you grew up in the mountains of Appalachia, that's a particularly rural area of the United States, if you grew up in the mountains of Appalachia and had never left your mountain home and suddenly found yourself teleported to the Times Square in New York City, okay, what would you do? You'd never been in a city before. You'd never seen more than 10 people, you know, at one time before. Um, you'd never seen a car. You'd never seen you know, any of these things. You've never seen a tall building. You've never seen a building more than one story tall, never seen one bigger than about 500 square feet. You see, what could you do? You're in a foreign place. 
How would you get around? How could you live? What would you do? Well, it's the same way. When you go out of body, it's like you're in a space now that you're totally unfamiliar with. You don't know anything about it. What do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is help. You know, find somebody that can help give you some information, can help show you around. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing is just let the larger consciousness system, you're still connected to the larger consciousness system, let it help you find where a productive place would be. So you use your intent and say, larger consciousness system, I'd like to learn something that helps me grow and, and decrease the entropy of my consciousness. I want to become a more spiritual, loving person. What sort of experiences do I need here? What kind of places should I see? And then just let it go. And you'll see that you're somewhere else. And there'll be an experience. And it'll be an opportunity for you to learn. So that's one way to learn. That's like when you go to Google. You know, and one of the, you can type in what you want, or you can punch that little button that says, I'm feeling lucky. Right? That's like punching the I'm feeling lucky button. You know, let somebody else decide. Take a, take a, uh, uh, you know, take a chance. So there's lots of ways that you can get around. That's, that's one of them. If, if it's important for you to go in a particular place or see a particular thing to your, to your learning, then somebody will probably show up and take you there or send you there. Okay, so that's how we learn in the beginning how to get around. You go explore a little, you come back. You go explore a little, you come back. Once you've gone to and back from the same thing a dozen times, it becomes part of your map, part of your territory that you understand. Once you communicate with this being and let it go and communicate with that being and you've done that 10, 15, 20 times, that connection becomes automatic. You can just kind of intend and think of that being and your minds are connected, just like that. So it's the same with, with places. It takes time. Make, Make your exploration of the larger reality a lifetime endeavor. It's not something you, you should work at for even a month or a year and then figure you've done it. Okay. It's, not that, uh, it's not that way. It's a lifetime of exploration, of open-minded skepticism. You can communicate with non-physical beings. Again, start, start uh, with intent of what you'd like to know why you'd like to know it. What's your motivation? If your no motivation is, I want to do something really cool, I want to see something really amazing, well then it's like you're at an amusement park and you want to be entertained. You probably will not connect with a very useful being if that's your attitude. You have to have an attitude that the larger consciousness system would like to feed, would like to cooperate with, you see? So you have to know why you're there and what you're doing. And if you're there just like a tourist that's lost, you know, it's like, uh, here I am. And I don't know where I am. I'm someplace, you know, in, in you know, Spain. I don't, I don't speak the language. You know, I, I don't know how to get around. I don't know where any of the streets go. You know, I'm just lost. If that's you in the larger consciousness system, then not much is going to happen. You're mainly you're probably going to just stay lost most of the time because you're not expressing an intent that will take you anywhere or that will have help come to help you go someplace. You're not having a, a motivation that is worthwhile, you see. It's not like going you know, to Madrid. It's not like going to London where you're going to a place and now you just can walk around and see the sights. It's just data. And if you don't use your intent and keep it focused, then you're just drifting. You're not going to get a lot of data. Okay. Um, so those are the things you can do. You can access the databases, access the actualized, unactualized databases, the probable future. A low entropy consciousness can easily access all the above with little effort and a lot of practice, but none of it is necessary to evolve the quality of your consciousness. Now, we're going to be talking about the larger reality, but I don't want you to get the idea that I have to do these things in order to grow up, in order to evolve the quality of my consciousness. You don't have to do these things. They're available to you. And a lot of people are interested in them because it's fun. It's an exploration. And you can use this exploration to 
increase the quality of your consciousness. Another thing I get a lot is, what about psychotropic drugs? You know, that's the way the shaman do it. That's the way these indigenous people do it. They take drugs and poof, they're out into the large reality system. They turn into wolves and run through the, you know, run through the, the out of body or something. And yes, drugs will blast you off into the larger consciousness system, but it's pretty much useless. There's no control. It's not under your own steam. It, uh, there's very little you can learn from it. It's just an experience. You come down off the drug and it was, wow, what, a, what an experience. Okay, well, it was just an experience. Experience by itself, just for its own sake, carries very little value. Okay, if the experience doesn't have some sort of uh, coherent content for you, then it's, it's you know, not much value. Now the one value that I, have, that I have witnessed, that I have seen in other people, they explain this to me. Now I've never taken hallucinatory drugs. I've always thought that uh, I needed to approach this very clear-headed. I'm a scientist, so being confusing, confusing drugs with you know, what I can do on my own is just like you know, not doing good science. That's just not the way it's done, so I've never, I've never been interested in that. But I have heard some people say that I tried some drugs, I tried LSD, say, or, or uh, uh, what's the other one, uh, spirit molecule, they call it, um, uh, yeah, DMT. I tried this once, and wow, I got such a, uh, you know, an amazing experience. I really understood then that reality is much bigger than just this physical reality. I could see a bigger picture, and that gave me the motivation to go seek and to learn and to find out something about it. So in that case, it was uh, opening the door, and it seemed to be productive. They didn't go back and do it again and again and again because they realized there was no value in that. They needed to learn how to do it themselves. They needed to go under their own power, not just be blasted into an experience and then come down. So I have run into people who have gotten something valuable from drug use, but it's only because they used it once or twice and then used that experience as motivation. If you depend on the drug to get you in a larger consciousness system, it's worse than not going at all because you become, it becomes more difficult. It's almost like you're digging yourself a hole you have to get out of. Doing it on your own becomes harder once you've been doing it with drugs. You don't have the patience because here you are, you're meditating, it isn't all like you get with the drug. You see, it's too slow, it doesn't work right, and patience is usually much less. Long-term ability, stick to itiveness is less. I find that people who have done drugs tend to not be able to get very far without them. So you do get, I think, in a worse off position for having gone that way. I don't recommend it. Um, Okay. Fear, belief, inexperience are the primary constraints. Okay. We've talked about that already. They're the primary constraints. Um, you know, belief, just, just simple beliefs like you believe that your consciousness is inside your body. That turns out to be a constraint. Um, so now we're going to talk about the limitations that are a function of you, the limitations that you bring to the problem. Okay, people tend to believe that the non-physical reality is just sort of like this reality, but strange. So they treat it in the same way. It's not like that. It's not at all like this reality. Um, they don't understand that they're not looking at an objective place. They, they have to realize they're just getting data, and they're interpreting that data based on their own beliefs, fears, understanding, their own experience. So their experience base is how they're interpreting the data they get. So you see, if your experience base is very limited, your interpretation of that data is very limited. Well, when you've never been out of body before and you've never toured around in the larger conscious system, your experience base is very limited. Again, it's like the, the, the blind man going from, from uh, you know, someplace in the mountains to New York City. How does he get around? 
How does he learn? Well, you learn a little bit at a, a little bit at a time. Um, often, what you'll find there is your own fear. If you have fears, then those fears will pop up and manifest in a physical way. If you are afraid that there's something out there in this big, scary, larger reality that's going to get you, you're liable to find that something big and scary that then tries to get you because that's your fear and you materialize it. Here, in this physical reality, we materialize our fears too. What we fear, we tend to make true. We materialize it. That's because if we have a fear, that's an intent. Remember how I said that if you have your healing intent, you keep it in the back of your mind, it'll give a lot more, a lot more uh, power to it just by constantly having a little pressure there on that intent? Well, that's what your fear is. Your fear is always there, and it's always this little pressure as far as the fear goes with your intent. And what that does is it manifests that fear in this reality. You do things that make your fear come true. So let's say you are afraid that people don't like you or won't like you. So you figure, nobody likes me. And what does that make you do? Does that make you be particularly nice and sweet to people? Probably not. You think nobody likes you, you probably become arrogant and pushy and act in ways that make people not like you. In other words, you create it. You see, if you're afraid that your children are going to grow up and, and uh, abuse drugs, so you never let them out of the house, you never let them out of your sight, you will drive them to use drugs because of your confinement, not let them get out into the world, you see. You'll create the problem you want to avoid. You, you create your fears. Well, in the non-physical, it doesn't take that long. Here, you may spend years manifesting a fear. There, it's seconds. If you have a fear, you have to face it. You manifest it. It comes right out. So, many people who are afraid, the first thing that happens to them when they get out of body is something scary happens. A monster shows up. Somebody attacks them. Some awful thing happens. That's just their fear. And until they can get past that fear, they're stuck there. They always have scary things going on. The larger consciousness system is not a good place for you to be if you have a lot of fear, because again, it's a place where you manifest those fears. It will be a, it will be a scary place for you. The larger consciousness system will look at you and say, this person's not ready. This person has too much fear. They really shouldn't be here in this reality because it's gonna scare them to death and then it'll inhibit them from growing up and learning about this because they'll be so frightened they won't ever want to do that again. So the larger consciousness system may be, may send that monster that jumps on you as soon as you get out of body just to see how you react. We call this a test, a fear test. And many of you as you first do out of body work will get fear tests. If you fail the test, which means you scream and run and you know, wake yourself up because it's terrifying, then you know, you'll have to, you'll get that test again and you'll get that test again and it'll be a difficult thing to do. If you don't, if you're fearless, and when that big monster runs at you, you just look at it and, and uh, say, well, what's up, doc? You know, uh, what's gonna happen here? Uh, you know, why are you doing that? You know, what is it about me that you don't like? Uh, you know, I have nothing against you, I love you. you know, and then finally that monster just kind of shimmers a little bit and pfft, goes away, you see? So that's the different attitudes you have to have. So when you have scary experiences in this out of body, it's you, mostly, that are scaring yourself with your fear. And the system will sometimes, if it's not you, will be giving you fear tests to see whether or not you are ready to get around in the larger consciousness system. Your communications in the larger consciousness system are telepathic, so you're just getting data and you're interpreting it. It's telepathic when you talk to other entities. Well, what's telepathic conversation like? It's not like language, it's not like speaking. Telepathic communication, you get a whole paragraph, a whole chapter at once. You know, you just get a knowing. You're having a communication, plunk, you got this, you know, this whole chapter of information and it's just instantaneous. That's the way 
It works. Telepathy doesn't give you letters that spell words that form into sentences. It's just a knowing. You get the information. A lot of people are confused by that. Now, here's, a, here's another example that will give you an idea how teleportation works. If, um, if you were to uh, describe, let's see, uh, describe this, this room. Uh, you could describe it in, a, in an objective way and in a subjective way. If we describe it in an objective way, we'd look around and we'd say, well, you know, it's white, uh, you know, ceilings with a lot of vents in them. There's this thing in the back that is black, that has white spots on it, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six of those little round thingies on this wall. The, the, you know, we have a carpet of this color. We have drapes, and they're red and white. If we're going to do it objectively, it's basically listing all the physical things that are in the room, right? That's what we would do. That would be our description of this room. If we describe this room subjectively, it's how does it feel? What's it used for? What's the ambience here? What's the sense and feeling of the purpose and, and nature of this room? Is it comfortable? Is it uh, rough? Does it kind of feel open with the, with the light coming in through the doors? You know, does it feel light? Does it feel heavy? That's our subjective feel of the room. Your telepathic communications are subjective. They're that sort of thing. You get the essence, the feeling, the nature. You get the information, but it's not about, you know, how many little round circles there were on the wall. You don't get that kind of information. When you interact with non-physical beings, it's about the relationship. It's about the content of the information. It's not about the physical details. See, it's not about the... You know, what was he wearing? What was the color of his eyes? Uh, you know, what's his name? We have this thing about, we want to name everything. So the first thing we ask some physical beings, what's your name? And mostly what you'll get, you'll notice, is kind of a pause like, what? Name? You know, they don't deal with names. You see, it's just an intent. If you want to go see George, you just intend to see George, and there's George. You don't have to use a name, and it's not like, well, there's George and Harry, how can I tell them apart? You know, what do they look like? Which one has the brown eyes and the blue eyes? It's not like that. You're not using your senses in this physical reality. Now, you come back and you talk about all the things you saw and heard, right? But you're not really using your senses. That's just you interpreting data into metaphors in terms of your physical senses because that's how you think. That's where your experience is, is with physical things. So when you go in the outer body and you see something, you've gotten data, you've interpreted it in a metaphor of something that you've seen. And it's that, it's, it's that vision is really your own creation. It's your own interpretation into physical sense data because that's what we think in terms of. We can't think in terms of something outside of physical sense data. You know, how big is it? What did it look like? You know. Uh, What's its name? You know, we get all this, this information we need, objective information. Okay, that's, uh, that's the way the communications are. So don't expect to hear language, to hear somebody talking to you. Now, you can hear that. It's not that language is impossible to hear. You can get a voice and it'll talk to you just like you're hearing me. Uh, typically, those are short snippets. They're not going to talk, you know, talk to you for, uh, you know, like they're, they're doing a, a speech. It's going to be short little snippets of things, and that's done because you're not yet able to do it on a more effective and efficient level, which is, which is the telepathy. So that's like for beginners. Sometimes the system will be kind to you and talk to you in words because you're not real good at picking it up telepathically yet. But for the most part, you're not going to get words if you're out exploring the larger consciousness system and run into entities there you want to communicate with, and you're not going to get names. But they don't mind you calling them a name. You can call them George, and that's fine with them. Or if you demand that they give you a name and say, well, what's your name? And they feel like, mm, you know, they'll come up with something. They'll make something up. It's not because that's really their name, but they'll give you a tag by which you can identify them because that's your habit of thinking. You need tags to identify people because you have always lived in an objective, what you think is an objective reality, and that's just the way you work. All right. Um, so the information 
is subjective because it has to be interpreted. You get data, you interpret it, it's a subjective interpretation. Now, that's true, of the, that's true in the outer body, that's true in the larger reality, it's also true of this reality. All the data you get here from this physical reality is personal, subjective data. There really is no such thing as objective data. There's only approximately objective data. But where there's much uncertainty, it's, the approximation's not even very good. Okay. Um, another thing is that if you're, let's say, remote viewing, and somebody says there's this conference room in this hotel that, uh, you know, I want you to go there, remote view, and tell me what you see. All right, so now this is a test. We want to know whether you're a good remote viewer or not. So we tell you to come to this conference room and tell me what you see. Well, what you'll go back and report is more of that subjective sense of the room. You're not likely to report all the physical details because those aren't important, you see. In the larger system, all the physical details, whether or not the, the covers on these tables are green or blue, just isn't important. So that kind of data often just doesn't exist. You may paint them blue or green just because you think you see there's covers and you think they ought to have color, you know, that may be an interpretation, but the system doesn't often have that kind of physical detail when it's not important. So what happens is you go back and you talk about the ambience, you talk about what the room's for, you say it's rectangular, it's about this big by about that long, and uh, you give it a general description, and the person scoring you says, well, no, that's not very good, you weren't there, you know, what was the color of the chairs? Uh, how many chairs were there? How many tables were there? Um, you know, was there a picture on the wall? And you go, well, you might even see that there was a picture on the wall, but you may miss the details in the picture, you see. So what the scientist who's, who's studying paranormal events or who is skeptical about the paranormal events, they will think that you're not really doing anything because you can't list the physical detail, which is how they would describe the room. But that's not what it's about. So you see, that's a, that's a general problem. So uh, back to the title, Fear and Belief. Fear, belief, and inexperience are the primary constraints that keep you from experiencing what is actually there, the full content of the data. Not from experiencing anything at all. You can experience some things with a lot of fear and belief and inexperience, but from experiencing what is actually intended by the larger consciousness system. Okay? So that's thing, those are the things that you can work on, getting rid of the fear, belief, and inexperience. With fear, belief, and inexperience, you still may be getting some data from the non-physical, but you may be missing much of the point and the growth opportunity. All right. Okay, what you're going to find when you get there, we've talked a little about this already. Um, I'm going to take some, uh, some examples from Bob and Rose book. It's a general book probably a lot of you have read. If not, many of you have had the same experience. Um, one of Bob's experiences he reported in his book was that he was out of body and he was coming back to his body and he ran into this big wall. And the wall was too wide to get around, too high to get over, too deep to get under. He was stuck. He couldn't get back. After a bit, he began to panic. Okay. Now, what was that wall? Do you think that the larger reality system has walls built up that if you're not careful, you can get trapped behind a wall? Of course not. That was his fear of not returning. Many people have a fear of death, a very strong fear of death, and they think that if they get out of their body, they may not come back and they will die. And if that's something that's holding you back, then you have to overcome that. You have to let that go. How do you let that go? You accept it. You say, I want to do this, and if I can't come back and my body dies, okay. I'll accept that. If you can't accept that, then you'll still have the fear. See, that's where being fearless comes in. If you're going to do this, then you need to be fearless. Say, all right, if I don't come back, I don't come back. But at least I tried. I went out, I did it, I did what I could do. I won't let that fear worry me. It's just like, okay, I know that if I get out and drive my car today, 
there's a one in 600 chance that I will have an accident and a one in 900 chance that the accident will be fatal. So I'm not gonna drive my car. I won't have a car. I won't fly in an airplane. I won't go out of my house, you see. We don't have that attitude there. We say, well, okay, it's a little risky, but you know, you gotta have a car, you gotta get around, so I'm gonna do it anyway. See what happens, take my chances. You have to do the same thing here. It's scarier here because it's the unknown. Driving cars, well, everybody does that. That's known, you see. But you need to have the same attitude. All right, it's probably not gonna hurt me. It'll probably be fine, I'll probably come back, but I'm not gonna let that fear stop me. If, if I don't come back, I don't come back. You need to be fearless, all right? The thing that gets you. Bob Monroe once found a hole in his reality, so he stuck his hand in it. And when he stuck his hand in it, something on the other side put a big hook through his hand, sort of like catching a fish. Well, that's the fear that something's going to get you. That's the fear you had when you were six years old and couldn't sleep with the light turned off because there was something scary under your bed or hiding in your closet. That's the fear of the thing that's going to get you. And that is a kind of a primal fear that most of us have at a deep level. Right? Back at the time when we were running from saber-toothed tigers, we kind of have this, this fear that something can get you. And uh, you have to deal with that. You have to let that go. Otherwise, when you get in the larger reality, something will get you because that's your fear. Um, uh, let's see. Um, going somewhere. Why is it in near-death experiences that almost everybody goes through a tunnel? Again, is the, is the uh, entrance to the larger reality a tunnel? You know, it's like going down a rabbit hole. You have to go through a tunnel to get there? Of course not. The larger reality is not full of tunnels, these tunnels of light. That's a belief. You have a belief, again, that you cannot get somewhere if you don't travel. The only way you have a sense of traveling is if your scenery goes by on either side. The most simple way to do that is to go through a tunnel. And you can see that you're going through this tunnel, there's light at the end, you're getting closer to the light, and the part of the tunnel that's around you is going by you. So you imagine a tunnel so that you can move, otherwise you couldn't move. You'd, have to, you'd be stuck right where you were. So if you're going to get to this non-physical reality, you have to move, you can fly, or you can walk through a tunnel. And that's, again, just a limitation. So that's why people see tunnels all the time. It's not that the reality is full of walls and tunnels. It isn't. It's full of, <laughs> this reality is full of people with a lot of beliefs. That's what it is. Uh, the white light. People will go and find a great white light, a being of such magnificence, such love. They run into this being and the light is, is awe-inspiring, and they feel the love, they feel the connectedness with the larger reality. This is a common experience, and it's, it turns out that it's the most beautiful experience that many people have ever experienced, and it feels so good and, and so wonderful, and they return, and that becomes a, a part of their motivation for learning and growing and becoming more spiritual. It's a big motivator for a lot of people. It's such a lovely experience. Well, what is that? That's you observing, experiencing the larger consciousness system. Now, how do you, how do you uh, produce that in your mind in terms of your physical senses with metaphors? It's a being. Well, of course it's a being because you're getting this sense of love for you. You don't get love from a rock. You get love from being. So right away it's a being. And because it's such a big being, you make it a really big white thing because you feel all the power. Well, we, don't, we wouldn't see this little peanut thing that was only one inch high and think, wow, that was really powerful, right? So we make it big. This is our metaphors for important and significant is big. It's full of love and wonderful energy, so it's white because we've got these metaphors that white, you know, the good guys, and, you know, and black is, is the evil, you know, the bad cowboys always wear the black hats. So it's just part of our cultural belief system. So we have these large white light beings that give us love. This is our first view of the larger consciousness system. That's what it is, it's love. And we interpret it that way. 
So it's a very common thing, and a lot of people will go back and do that over and over again because it's such a wonderful experience. You feel very fulfilled and very satisfied after that kind of an experience. It is quite wonderful, but it's common. Um, if you read any of the early out-of-body literature, Baldoon and Carrington, Fox, um, there's several others. This is back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, out-of-body was a was kind of a big thing in the, in the middle of the late 1800s. And you will find that everybody went out of body, was attached to their body with a silver cord. So again, the idea was you leave your body, you are a spirit that lives in the body. And then when you leave the body, it's like an idea of a, of a deep sea diver, right? The deep sea diver has to have a, an air hose, has to be attached to the boat, to the air compressor with a, with a hose. It was the same way. The spirit belonged to the body, was attached to the body. And if it needed this cord as a lifeline. So that's just a belief. So it always, in order to feel safe, it had its connection, its silver cord. And wherever it went, it could always find the silver cord. And that's how it could always get back and et cetera. Because the body would die without the spirit. So now the spirit had gone out of the body. So to keep the body from dying, it needed to have a cord. So again, like the divers like the diver's hose, right? So that belief created silver cords. Now when Bob Monroe wrote his books, and everybody that's written about out of body in the last 40 years or 50 years, there's no silver cords. So did silver cords go out of fashion? No. The belief systems changed such that the silver cord was no longer necessary. You see? Um, now, some people, particularly those who read those old books about the silver cords, they still see silver cords because it's part of their metaphors now of how they think about the way things work. They pick up that belief. Uh, let's see what else we can talk about. Um, oh, specific beings. If you are a religious person, you are likely to see angels instead of guides. If you run into a being that is particularly knowledgeable and you feel the, the very high quality of their consciousness, they may be religious figures, they may be saints, they may be you know, Gabriel and Peter and whoever the archangels are and so on. Because that's your metaphor for that kind of a being. That's how you interpret that. That's what makes sense to you. If you are not from that sort of a religious thing, then maybe they look like a, you know, an ancient master you know, the part of the ancient masters, the guru, the whatever. And if you're not from that, then they're just this wise being I ran into, you see. So you interpret based on your experience. Besides that, if somebody wants to communicate to you and get a message across, a larger consciousness system, right? It bubbles up a guide. So let's say it bubbles up this guide and this guide wants to interface with you and it's a, it's a personal message, has a lot of emotional content and it needs to be credible to you. Well, it's not going to show up as a two-headed horse because that's not going to, you're not going to accept that information. It's gonna show up as your deceased grandmother, as your, you know, some other kind of a, a figure that immediately gets emotional credibility. Why? Because they're trying to communicate with you and that's a good way to communicate with you. When you die, one of the things you will find, depends on how, where you are, again, if, you're, if you are still in the beginning stages or even the middle stages, what you will find is you're often met by relatives, okay, on the other side. You'll have your aunts and uncles or your mother and father or somebody come and, and be like a, a Walmart greeter. You know, they, they greet you as, you as you come through the door. All that is is to put you at ease. And if you like, we'll talk a little bit about the process of death and what happens afterwards, and I can tell you some of that. But why is it your family? Because that comforts you. You feel good then. Well, they're here, and they're made it, and they're all smiling and welcoming you, so it must not be bad. Puts you at ease immediately. Is that really your mother and father and Uncle Fred and your children? No, it's just information out of the database.